The following is a selected video from MasterTheContent.com where you will find an extensive video library of lectures for a variety of standardized admission tests. We offer over 600 hours of detailed video lectures for a multitude of standardized tests. Use our interactive in-lecture table of contents to find specific topics of interest. Work through numerous in-lecture examples to help you internalize concepts. To learn more, visit MasterTheContent.com. Your career, our passion. Example ionic radius. Which element has an ionic radius that is smaller than its atomic radius? To really understand this question, what we're first going to need to do is really figure out what an ionic radius is. And in order to do so, it's a good idea for us to look at valence shells, valence electrons, and various trends that take place on the periodic table. And we'll talk about ions and ionic charges as well. So let's do that first, and then we'll come back to our question. Looking here at figure 1.2, uh, as we see here, the, the elements on the periodic table all have partially filled outermost shells except for our noble gases. Now, if we take a look here at group 1, group 1 is going to have one valence electron in its outermost shell. And what is a valence electron? Let's just do a quick uh, definition here and then we'll get back to our slide. A valence electron is an electron of an atom located in the outermost shell, the valence shell of the atom. Now. Group 1 elements have one valence electron. Group 2 elements have two valence electrons. Don't worry about the transition metals. This block here, we'll cover it when we need to. And uh, it's not really going to be uh, related too much into the type of questions you're going to be coming across. Now, the third main group, as we see here, has three valence electrons. The fourth main group has four valence electrons, the fifth group has <clears throat> five valence electrons, six valence electrons, and seven valence electrons. Now, one other point that I would like to make about the noble gases is the, the helium atom is the only one here that has two electrons in its outermost shell, and the rest of the noble gases here, they have eight electrons in their outermost shell. Now, these atoms, right, these atoms, they want to get that, they want to get that filled outermost shell as we see here for our noble gases. Now, there's one of two ways that an, an atom can do that. It can either gain an electron or it can lose an electron. And when an atom gains or loses an electron, it is then considered to be an ion. Furthermore, from the, ele from the element's position on the periodic table, we can determine whether or not it's actually going to gain or lose an electron. Let's take a look at that now. Looking here at group one, group two, or excuse me, group one is going to lose one electron, that one valence electron it had. Group two is going to lose two valence electrons. Group three is going to lose three valence electrons. And group four can either gain or lose four valence electrons. Now, group five is going to gain three electrons. Group six would rather gain two electrons. And group seven is going to gain one electron. Now, to further elucidate our point, let's take a little bit of a deeper look at that. More specifically, we'll take a look at the fluorine atom, the fluorine atom in group seven. If we take a look at fluorine here in figure 1.3 down here, we see that fluorine has how many? It has seven valence electrons, right? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Now, this fluorine atom can either lose seven electrons, right? Or it can gain an electron. It's going to gain the, that one electron, right? Now, when fluorine gains that electron, it is then considered, that fluorine atom gains that electron, it is then considered to be a fluoride ion. And that fluoride ion is going to carry with it a negative charge. It's going to carry with it a negative charge. Now, if we come back up here to <clears throat> figure 1.2, we see that it's going to have that. We see all elements here right in group seven right when they gain an electron they're going to have a negative one charge and what is that negative one charge telling us the negative one charge here it's telling us that it's going to have one more electron than proton now similarly with group six in order to obtain that that arrangement right that full arrangement it's going to gain two electrons, giving it a negative two charge, meaning it's gonna have two more electrons than protons. Same, same thing for group three, it's gonna gain three electrons, giving it a negative three charge, meaning it has three electrons, excuse me, it has a, uh, it has a negative three charge because it has three additional electrons, it's three more electrons than protons. Now, let's contrast, let's contrast the, these ions over here, right, with the ions in group, group one and two that actually 
are going to be gain, uh, excuse me, going to be giving up an electron relative to gaining an electron, as we had just seen. More specifically, we'll take a look at sodium here. We'll take a look at sodium. Now, in figure 1.3, right, if we take a look at sodium here, we see that sodium has one valence electron, right? And recall we said that group 1 elements have one valence electron. So sodium, it can either give up that one electron, right, or it can gain a bunch of electrons. Now, it's going to give up that one electron, and when sodium gives up that one electron, it's going to become a sodium ion, as we see here, right? It's going to become a sodium ion, and it's going to have a positive charge, right? Thus, if we come back up here, we see that group 1 elements, such as sodium, they're going to have a positive charge upon giving up their electron, indicating to us that it's going to have one more proton than electron. And similarly, for group 2, elements as we see here it's going to give up two electrons and give up three electrons here in group three now now that we understand how valence electrons work what the tendencies are of the different groups right and recall earlier we said that elements within a group right they have similar chemical properties right so now that we know which which elements are more likely to give up electrons, right? And which elements are more likely to gain electrons? Let's use that knowledge and see what happens when an element either gives up an electron, what happens to this uh, ionic or atomic radius, right? Or the uh, ion, we can say the, atom, the atomic size here, right? Or what happens to that ionic or atomic radius when it gains an electron? Let's see how that impacts either uh, uh, it will, how it will impact the element on the next slide. Let's take a look at that. Now, looking looking here at at our looking here now. Before we proceed, recall we just we had just said the 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 atomic the atomic radius once the atom gives up or gains an electron or gives up an electron right or loses an electron we can say then we are referring to its ionic radius now coming here to number one we see that if no protons are added but an electron is removed from the atom the radius of the atom will increase or decrease now before we move on to that let's consider this for a second we have to recall that electrons there they have repulsive forces right and electrons and con in, in contrast an electron and a proton have attractive forces now coming back here if no protons are added we're not changing the attractive force right but an electron is what it's removed right the electron is removed and if the electron is removed from the atom what's happening is we're taking away repulsive forces so if we take if we take away repulsive forces then that atomic radius is going to decrease right thus we can then say that if no protons are added but an electron is removed from the atom the radius of the atom will decrease now how about in number two? Let's take a look at this scenario. If no protons are added, but an electron is added to the atom, the radius of the atom will increase or decrease. Now, once again, we see that there's no change with the attractive force, right? But what's happening with the electrons? There's an electron that's being, excuse me, let me just make that consistent. But an electron is being, but an electron is being added to the atom. Now, if we add an electron to the atom, it's going to push those, those electrons farther from the nucleus, right? Thus, if it's going to push those electrons farther from the nucleus, then that's going to increase, it's going to increase that atomic radius, right? And if it increases that atomic radius or ionic radius, we can say, all right, if no protons are added, but an electron is added to the atom, right, the radius of the atom will increase. Okay, great. Now, one other term that I would like to introduce to you before we move on is what is known as the effective nuclear charge. Let's actually proceed to the next slide, and we'll talk a little bit more about this there. Here we are. Effective nuclear charge. Now, if we look here at figure 1.5, we see that these outer electrons, right, these outer electrons, 